All right, diving into red here. So red, I think, is the weakest color overall in Homelands Limited. Um, it's not that it does nothing. Um, I just think that all of the other colors offer something a little bit more powerful in terms of what they can do. Um, green's also not very powerful in Homelands. Uh, all right, so Alaban's Tower is an instant, uh, red and a colorless. A blocking creature gets plus three, plus one until end of turn. So if you could use this offensively, it would work pretty well with your first striking creatures. Um, as it is, instead you can use it defensively, and uh, it sets up an enormous ground stall. Now, uh, Ambush Party is not very good because it has one toughness, but uh, a Naba Bodyguard is a 2-3 first striker. And that means your opponents need to respect that uh, you could have an Alaban's Tower, which means anything with five toughness or less, when you've got that bodyguard up, probably can't afford to attack in or you can blow out the combat stuff. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't help you to punch through in any way. It just helps you to uh, stall out the board. Um, Alaban's Tower is not useless, but... Um, I'm going to give it about a 1. Yeah, I'll give it about a 1. Um, you, know, you, you can play it, but you're probably going to end up cutting it from your final deck list. Uh, ambush, I think, is even worse. So it's a 4-mana instant blocking creatures gain first strike until end of turn again. This only works on defense. And uh, red has a couple of common first strikers already which means the value you get out of Ambush is somewhat diminished because you have access to a lot of First Strike already. And you can't push it on offense, it's only on defense. I think Ambush is about a 0 0.5. Now, more of a sideboard card than something you really run in the main deck. All right, Ambush Party, this card's a little bit of a trap. Uh, it's 5 mana, it's a 3-1. The one toughness is a big problem. Uh, first strike and haste. Now, it makes it sound like it would be a pretty good creature on offense. Um, but truth be told, there are a lot of ways to uh, create a board state where a 3 1 first striker cannot get through. Um, so if you're attacking into a blue deck, they may have a giant oyster already. You get in this uh, one hit for three, maybe, and then they keep it tapped down, and it dies once it gets a minus one counter from the oyster. Or uh, blue at five mana has a four or five defender, dark maze. Um, in white, they've got Abbey Matron. It's a 1-3 that can pay a white and tap to give itself another 3 toughness. So just Abbey Matron by itself can block and kill an ambush party. Or uh, you know, any of white's little creatures plus um, you know, a Samite Alchemist can prevent 4 damage that would be dealt to their creature. Can win in combat against the ambush party. Um, in black... Uh, black has Cemetery Gate. Uh, it has, uh, at 6 mana, a 5-5, five, five, right? It's on Shade. Uh, black also has um, some of the better uh, creature kill spells of the format, like Dry Spell. Um, so between Dry Spell and Serrated Arrows, Ambush Party's not very good against Black. There's, um, there's just a lot of reasons... A lot of a lot of defensive setup in this uh, game where ambush party works better as a defender than as an attacker, and with the one toughness, it's almost a liability when the opponent plays a serrated arrows. That's just one counter off of their serrated arrows. So ambush party, it's not useless, but um, hmm, I think it's maybe a one point five. It's uh, it's pretty pretty weak 
Nava Ancestor. It's a rare. Uh, another target Minotaur targets plus one, plus one. Uh, this would be pretty good, right? There are a number of Minotaurs that Red has access to. There's also a blue Minotaur, Labyrinth Minotaur. So this card would be pretty good, except that as a 1-1, one, one, it just dies to the cards I've already mentioned, like Dry Spell and Serrated Arrows. And, or if the opponent has an Anaba Shaman. So uh, Anaba Ancestor, you know, I'm going to give it about a 1. It's kind of a trap as a build around rear. Doesn't actually do what you want it to do in the Minotaur deck, because it just dies. Anaba Bodyguard. This is uh, a really good common in red. So 2 3 with First Strike. Um, it's also a Minotaur. It can get buffed up by the Anaba Spirit Crafter. Right? That's, that's the rear you actually want for the Minotaur deck. It gives Minotaur creatures plus one, plus zero. Um, but just the bodyguard on its own is uh, pretty fantastic. You know, one copy of this will keep away a lot of creatures with the first strike. Two copies of this starts to keep away even some of the biggest creatures of the format with first strike. Works very well on defense. And uh, for offense... If you pair up a Nava Bodyguard with a black deck and you put Feast of the Unicorn on it, then you've got a 6-3 First Striker, and that could actually punch through uh, to get in combat damage. It doesn't solve the problem of Giant Oyster, but if the opponent doesn't have Giant Oyster, then uh, Feast of the Unicorn on a Nava Bodyguard is a pretty good, pretty solid uh, line for, you know, being able to actually get into combat. Uh, overall, I think this card's a three. I think if you have it, it always makes it into your red deck. It's just good. Anaba Shaman. This is uh, probably the strongest common in red. It's a two, two for four. You can pay a red and tap and it pings. Deals one damage to any target. So this can uh, pair up you know, just kill one toughness creatures or pair up with, you know, another effect like Serrated Arrows or a second Anaba Shaman to kill two toughness creatures. It can also just damage the opponent's face. Now, Anaba Shaman runs headlong into the problems of Giant Oyster. But still, I think uh, from how versatile and useful a pinger is in this format, I'd still give it a 3.5. It's still one of the best red cards. Uh, a Nobbit Spirit Crafter is a rare. It's a 1-3 for 4. Minotaur creatures get plus 1, plus 0. Uh, this is symmetrical, right? We'll buff the opponent's Minotaurs, but if you're crafting around this card, then you're going to have more Minotaurs than they will. And uh, some of your best creatures are Minotaurs anyway. So I think a Nobbit Spirit Crafter in red um, is probably about a 4. Um, you know, I think you would play as many of these as you can run, because they'll start buffing each other up. Alright, so then you have... And it does give the benefit to itself. It's a 2-3 to start with. So if you had two of these out, they'd be 3-3s. Three and then 4-3s, and then, you know, just on from there. Uh, the bonus they give to the first strikers, and not the bodyguard, is really phenomenal. Getting a big, powerful First Striker into this format, just, just the first plus one, turning it into a 3-3 three, three First Striker, uh, pairs very well with most of the creatures in the format. Uh, there are so many 3-3s three, for five. So, uh, yeah, I think a Nava Spirit Crafter is like a four for red. Uh, it's very strong. You can really make the Minotaur deck work if you've got this card. All right, Anzarin Ruins. So, uh, four mana, red enchantment. As Anzarin Ruins enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Creatures of the chosen type don't untap during their controller's untap steps. Uh, it's a rare, double red. This is a phenomenal card. Um, it's by far one of the strongest cards of the format. Uh, it's going to make a splash in Constructed, too. 
um, you know, soldier decks, Phyrexian decks, human decks, uh, they're in trouble. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, Enzer and Ruins, in this uh, limited format, you know, there are some there are some major tribes that you can name. Minotaurs in red, uh, or red-blue, or uh, fairies in uh, mostly green, green-blue, or there's also uh, birds in white-blue, and then you can also just, you know, name a creature that the opponent has tapped down over there that you don't, and you can keep them tapped down. You know, it sounds ridiculous, but you could name Oyster and keep the giant oysters tapped down. So that's a way that, um, you know, you could really play with uh, the balance of the format, kind of turn things on their head. Right, you come over for a big attack. The blue player uh, taps all of their uh, giant oysters to keep your creatures locked down and get minus counters. Then, on your turn, you play Anzaren Ruins, name Oyster. And even though they got their effect from the oysters once, they're never going to get it again. So if you can lock down, you know, two or three or four giant oysters by doing this, then you're in a great position from there to be able to come back and take over the game. Just, um, there are so many great applications for this card. I'm, I'm pretty sure this is one of the biggest bombs of the format. It gets like a 4.5. Um, really, it's just just an incredible tool in this format. All right, Chandler. Um, so this is notably a common legend. This is a common legend in red. He's a human rogue, 3-3 three, three for 5. Uh, pay 3 red and tap destroy target artifact creature. Uh, Chandler is very powerful because... Some of the most important, uh, you know, creatures in this format are actually artifact creatures. Um, they're, they're quite strong. They're very useful. They go in any color, and Chandler can blow them up for you. He's a common answer to it. So this is actually one of the better red cards. Um, the drawback of being a common legend, though, uh, it cannot be overlooked. Normally, you would probably play, you know, <laughs> several copies of Chandler if you could pick them up. But being legendary holds the card back, because you can only have one in play at a time. And this is not the only common legend. Uh, this is one of the reasons red's one of the weaker colors. Um, Joven and Chandler, they would be, you know, really strong things going for red, but you can't run multiples of them out at the same time. And uh, that's a big problem in a small format like this, where you're going to see a lot of multiples of commons. Anyway, Chandler is good. Um, in red, it's uh, I think it's definitely like a 3. Uh, because it's legendary, I can't rate it higher than that. You know, if you could run multiples, I'd call it like a 3.5 easily. Um, still, um, useful card, useful effect. Um, it's kind of, its size is about right, par for the course, out of range of uh, you know the really easy removal. So he's good. Just wish he wasn't legendary. Dwarven pony. Uh, this is a trap. So dwarves are not really much of a tribe in homelands, and a one-one is just kind of a liability. It'll just. Uh, you know, one counter off of serrated arrows, get swept up by a dry spell, get pinged by an Anaba Shaman, get killed by Grandmother Singir. Uh, it, it's a trap. This, you know, giving a dwarf mountain walk is not useless. So, eh, mm, I guess I'll give it like a one, maybe a one and a half. It, it, it's bad. All right, Dwarven Sea Clan, 1-1 one, one for 3, also not very good. You can choose an attacking or blocking creature whose controller controls an island. All right, so this only works if your opponent has islands. Deals 2 damage to that creature at end of combat. So after, you know, combat damage has been dealt and all of that, then 
This will deal two damage to it. You can only activate it before the end of combat step. Uh, this would be a useful effect. You know, um, even though it only works if the opponent has an island, if you were a red-blue deck, you could run Jinx, and Jinx could turn on the Dwarven Sea Clan. The problem is it has one toughness, which means it doesn't really do what you want it to do, and uh, it's like a 1.5. Niche application, um, probably just going to die. So probably not worth your time, unfortunately. Dwarven Trader, this is a common. It's just a 1-1 one, one for 1 red. Uh, again, little 1-1s one and stuff. 1 toughness creatures are traps in this format. Uh, if you wanted to, you could see if you could make, you know, like the red sly deck where... You pick up, like, 15 Dwarven Traders, you see if you can, you know, just curve out with one on turn one, two on turn two, three on turn three, and see if you can, you know, tempo the opponent out of the game before they manage to get their Giant Oysters, Serrated Arrows, or Dry Spell. Um, I don't think it would work. I don't think it would really work. I, I think that deck would fail you. You'd get, some, you'd get in some early damage, and then... Um, you would just be sad. I'm going to give Dwarven Trader a 1. Uh, really close to being a 0 0.5. Arrow on the Relentless. So, it's 5 mana. He's a legendary 5-2 human rogue. He has haste. And you can pay 3 red to regenerate him. So, uh, Aaron's a, a little bit fragile. He does have two toughness, so two toughness puts him out of range of the really easy removal. And regenerating can help him stay alive against you know, a Naba Shamans and Dry Spells, as long as you have the mana open. Uh, being five power actually uh, makes him one of the better creatures of the format. And five power with haste uh, there's a there's a decent chance he could actually crash in the turn that you play him, uh, which is not true of most creatures in this format. Uh, he's big enough that he could threaten real combat damage, so uh, I think yeah you know, he, he's a great blocker. You know, five two can regenerate. Um, not the worst attacker. Uh, if you have the man open to regenerate him, then he's uh, quite a good attacker. Uh, if your opponent, you know, doesn't have, like, double serrated arrows or whatever, and doesn't seem like they're going to be able to, you know, kill him with uh, toughness reduction, then in Black Red you could, um, you know, get a Feast of the Unicorn on Aaron. Then he's a nine-power creature that can regenerate, and he can kind of crash in pretty indiscriminately if the opponent doesn't have giant oysters or a uh, first strike. Right, because if they first strike him, you can regenerate him, but he'll be removed from combat, and then he won't deal damage back to the first striker. Um, anyway, overall, I, I think Aaron's about a four. He's, he's really one of the better red cards. Um, he's a way that uh, you threaten real uh, chance of winning with damage. Uh, he's got his uses and his applications. I'm going to give him a 4. Uh, evaporate. Uh, I think this card is a trap. So this is an uncommon. It's 3. Uh, it's a sorcery. Deals 1 damage to each white and or blue creature. Now, there are some 1 toughness white and blue creatures. And it's not impossible that you could, you know, Set up Evaporate, you know, you get down an Anaba Shaman or two Anaba Shamans, and then you play Evaporate and you can set up, like, a ping or a double ping with the Shamans to help kill a larger white or blue creature. But um, the real problem is that Evaporate only hits, you know, two colors of things, and it doesn't deal with them as effectively as you want. I'll explain why. So, Sarah Paladin in white is a 2-2, and it can tap to prevent one damage to any target. And just 
the, the opponent having one copy of Sarah Paladin on the field is a real headache for trying to find a way to make this card useful against white. And uh, if they have two copies, it just gets worse from there. Some of white's other creatures, like Samite Alchemist, can prevent four damage to a target. Um, or uh, Abbey Matrons can give itself a boost of three extra toughness. Uh, uh, Mesa Falcon can give itself extra toughness. Uh, white is incredibly prepared for Evaporate. So uh, it almost never is going to do what you want it to do against white. And against blue, some of the most problematic things that you really need to get out of the way in a blue deck are not their little things. Uh, the blue player is not probably going to prioritize, you know, Sea Troll and uh, Giant Albatross. If they're going to run a flyer, it's probably going to be Sea Sprite, which has protection from red. Um, Giant Oyster has three toughness, which is pretty hard to make that work with Evaporate. And then there's Dark Maze, which is a 4-5. Obviously, that's way out of range of Evaporate. So um, even against the colors that this hits in the format, it doesn't really do the job that you need it to do. And for that reason, I think Evaporate is not just a 0 0.5. I think Evaporate is actually a 0. I think... Um, even when you're against a white or blue deck, that this probably is just not what you need, almost ever. Um, because it costs three instead of two, I don't even know that multiples of it can do the same thing that dry spell could. I talked about how you could, you know, cast two dry spells in a turn or three dry spells in a turn. It's unreasonable to expect that you could get to a game state where you could cast three evaporates in the same turn and then have any mana left over to ping with your Inaba Shamans. I'm not saying it couldn't happen, but Evaporate doesn't even hit every color of creature, so it doesn't have the same use cases that Dry Spell does. <sighs> yeah, I'm going to give it a zero. Just, just don't play it. All right, Heart Wolf, this is a rare. It's a 2-2 wolf for 4. It has first strike. So, you know, here's another reasonable first striker that you could have in your red deck. Um, I don't think this is as good as, uh, you know, the Anaba bodyguard, but it's, it's playable. And it can tap to give target dwarf plus 2, plus 0, and gain first strike until end of turn. And if that dwarf leaves the battlefield this turn, you sacrifice the heart wolf. You can only activate it during combat. There aren't a lot of instant speed tricks um, that can blow you out in this format. Black has a broken visage, but that's a rare. And it's five mana. So uh, it's unlikely to get blown out by a combat trick. Or a green has shrink for one green mana that gives minus five power to something. But mostly I don't think uh, you would get blown out. It's the problem is that there are no uh, dwarves with more than one toughness. So even though this is a pretty good, uh, you know, kind of tribal lord, whatever, for a dwarf deck, none of the dwarves are really worth playing. Uh, because they die so easily. Which means that Heartwolf mostly is just going to be a 2-2 first striker, and that means Heartwolf's probably about... A two and a half or a three. It's fine, right? A two-two first striker for four is fine in this format, but it's, it's just not as good as you would hope it would be. All right, next up we've got Iron Claw Curse. Uh, this is a rare. It's one red aura. You enchant a creature, it gets minus zero, minus one, and it also can't block creatures with power equal to or greater than its toughness. So, uh, you shrink the toughness of a creature a little bit, and then it gets, uh, you know, the kind of drawback that Ironclaw Orcs does. Where uh, it's afraid to block if the creature that it would be blocking would kill it, in other words. Uh, this can help you uh, get through for combat damage. Um, 
you know, could kill your opponent's little things. It's also kind of like a one-two punch with an Anava Shaman or a Serrated Arrows, where uh, you shrink the toughness a point, and then you can, you know, alley-oop, follow up, and uh, shrink at another point. Uh, it's really, it's really not bad. And if you can uh, get some crucial blocker that the opponent has to where it uh, can't block your creature anymore, then uh, then that's a big deal. Uh, one other uh, potential use for Iron Claw Curse, which I don't think would come up very much, because Iron Claw Curse is a rare, and Baki's Curse is a rare in blue. But if you if you had a lot of Iron Claw Curse, if you happen to have a draft pool with a bunch of Iron Claw Curses, then you could instead of just making a blue black Baki's Curse deck with a Funeral March you could throw Iron Claw Curse into the mix as another aura that debuffs a creature and then later pairs up with Baki's Curse to kill it, right? Because Baki's Curse deals two damage to a creature for every aura that's on it, and Iron Claw Curse lowers its toughness. So then, you know, you stick Iron Claw Curse on a three toughness creature, Baki's Curse can finish it off. That's pretty good. Uh, anyway, I, I think Ironclaw Curse, um, you know, it, it pairs up nicely with the other removal of the format and um, gives you some option, some potential avenue to make, uh, to remove a blocker to be able to get in for damage. So uh, I think Ironclaw Curse is probably about a three. I think you play about as many as you get in a red deck. It, it's pretty good. All right, Joven. This is the other uh, legend, legendary creature that's common. Joven and Chandler, they're thieves. Um, they like to steal artifacts. So he's a 3-3 human rogue. Um, pay three red and tap, destroy target, non-creature artifact. So in this format, that would pretty much be uh, serrated arrows and uh, Joven's tools. Joven's tools can help a creature get through unblocked if you don't have any walls, and that would be worth blowing up with Joven. Or uh, if the opponent has a serrated arrows and they've only, you know, used the first counter on it, right? Like it's tapped with two counters on it, or it's untapped with three counters on it, and they're waiting to use it, then Joven can blow up that uh, serrated arrows, and they don't get the full value out of it. And that's a really nice use of Joven. Because Serrated Arrows is like one of the creme de la creme, like most powerful cards of this format. So Joven being able to deal with it at least partially is very nice. Um, some of the rare artifacts don't really matter if you blow them up, right? Apocalypse Chime, it, the opponent only needs to hold two mana open to use it at instant speed. So Joven can't really save you from an Apocalypse Chime. Uh, Didgeridoo is not that great. You know, you might run it if you happen to have a Minotaur deck, but it only lowers the cost of the Minotaurs to three and lets you put them out at instant speed. Uh, Didgeridoo's not that big of a deal. So really, it's um, Joven's Tools and Serrated Arrows, but that is good enough. You would already play Joven just as a 3-3 three, three for five. is a reasonable size of creature in this format. And he's got a useful ability. Uh, the real drawback is he's legendary, so you can't have more than one on the battlefield at the same time, which is a problem in such a small set where you're going to see so many repeat commons. But uh, I still think Joven's about a three. Orcish Mind. This is an uncommon aura, one red red, enchant land. Enters battlefield with three ore counters. Um, so at the beginning of your upkeep, you remove an ore counter, and whenever the enchanted land becomes tapped, you remove an ore counter. So it's ticking away, and it ticks away faster if the opponent uses the land. When the last ore counter is removed, you destroy the enchanted land, and the mine deals two damage to the land's controller. So um, if you're a little newer to magic, and you don't remember older formats when land destruction was uh, printed at common and uncommon, uh, most of the time people said that you shouldn't run land destruction in limited. That, uh, you know, 
most people would pack extra lands into a limited deck. Like running 17 lands in a 40 card deck is a generous amount. And a lot of uh, limited formats tend to be um, kind of fast. People prioritize like, you know, two drop creatures and stuff. And so it's hard to uh, meaningfully limit an opponent's mana before they've uh, played a bunch of stuff onto the battlefield. So the, uh, the common wisdom back in the day was that you don't run land destruction in your limited deck. But this is not your usual format. I think um, with how mana hungry all of the colors are, and that the best, best creatures that you're going to find are at 5, 6, 7, and 8 mana. And, you know, white has Sarah Beast Cherry that costs 2 white every upkeep. Green has Hungry Mist that costs 2 green every upkeep. Now, they're all kind of activated abilities. Um, all the colors uh, have intense single color mana requirements. I think Orcish Mine can easily punish a two or three or more color deck. And a lot of people are going to have to resort to playing two colors in limited. It's just kind of the way the game goes. Hard to find enough playables in one color. And even if you're in one color, you might be trying to push to an end game where you cast um, Marjan or Baron Singir or Ebony Rhino and get these uh, giant late game things onto the battlefield. So I think Orcish Mine is actually going to be pretty good in this format. Um, I think I would play about as many of these as you get. I, I think this card's about a three. I think it, uh, you know, kind of always makes the cut into red. It, it has a uh, reach uh, to the opponent's life total, right? Just kind of shocks them to the face. So every Orcish Mine you play is getting a little bit of extra damage in, right? Because the ground uh, is going to stall, and it's hard to uh, find a way to get through on the ground in this format. Um, Orcish Mine can help find a way find a way forward, and if you cut off their mana and you cut off their most powerful cards and they're stuck in their hand, then you might be able to take, uh, you know, Air on the Relentless, or, uh, you know, a, a Naba Bodyguard that's got a Feast of the Unicorn on it. You might be able to take some early game start with some Orcish Mines and run the opponent out of the game and keep them off your back and keep them from their, you know, game-winning plan. Uh, in a two-color deck, it's also pretty easy to deny them the colors that they need. So, yeah, I think Orcish Mine's like a three. Uh, Retribution. Retribution is, this is like the premium removal of red. Um, so it's right up there with an Abba Shaman. It's a four mana sorcery, double red. You choose two creatures an opponent controls. The player sacrifices one, and you put a minus one, minus one counter on the other. And because red can take advantage of this minus one counter with, uh, you know, pingers like a Naba Shaman, or, you know, just serrated arrows, uh, this means that it's very likely that Retribution is going to kill two of their creatures. And that makes this a spectacular card in red. It's one of the few really strong draws into red. Um, I think it's like a 3.5. Uh, it's it's top-notch. Uh, Retribution can also work well um, if you're using uh, black and you're using Funeral March. Then uh, you could be able to put the opponent into a no-win situation where... Uh, you know, you put a Funeral March on a One Toughness thing, then Retribution uh, kills it either way. And then they have to sacrifice another creature, and then there's a minus one counter to worry about. It, it's just good. It's like a 3.5. Uh, Winter Sky. 
So one red sorcery, it's a rare. Flip a coin. If you win, you deal one damage to each creature and each player. If you lose the flip, each player draws a card. Uh, I don't think Winter Sky is very good. You can't rely on it to deal one damage to each creature and each player. And since you can't rely on it, that kind of makes it like a bad dry spell. Now you could try to uh, put it in a deck where if you lose the flip, each player drawing a card is still beneficial. Uh, blue is very good at stalling out the game to the point that the opponent will mill out. And uh, they've got a rare named Forget that can force the opponent to draw more cards, um, mill them out a little faster. Uh, Winter Sky, making each player draw a card. If you've stacked your deck with more cards than the opponent's deck has, Winter Sky can help advance your uh, mill strategy. So in that deck in particular, you might be able to use either side of this card no matter how the coin flips. Um, otherwise, it's just kind of a, a risky uh, bet to try to pair it with, uh, you know, a Naba Shaman and Retribution and stuff to maybe work as a removal spell. I think Winter Sky is like a one. It's not quite unplayable, but it's really borderline. All right, that brings us to the end of red. Uh, next up's going to be green, so uh, tune in to the next episode of this. And uh, until then, stay cool.